um, just in case, um, sorry, I don't know what I'm saying. Um, we are gonna be recording. Um, so if anyone is not okay with that, please let us know. But otherwise we are going to record um, just for the sake of folks who may not have been able to uh, make the workshop. It's pretty often that we have students who um, can't attend because of class or whatnot. So just so everyone can benefit from it. Um, so today um, we have with us Leanne, uh, who is going to be talking about cybersecurity for activists. So if you've ever um, wondered how to be safe uh, with like your phone in a protest situation or what sort of apps you should use or like text messaging, how to encrypt your data, stuff like that. Um, we're going to be covering all of that today. So um, I believe we'll be checking for questions regularly throughout the presentation. So feel free to just put your questions in the chat and uh, we will definitely get to them. Um, there may be some folks rolling in a bit late and that's totally fine, but we are going to get started. So Leanne, take it away. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, so as we go through the workshop, also feel free to, I personally like when people unmute themselves and just go ahead and ask questions, but feel free to also type in the chat. Um, yeah, let's go. So just, um, we'll be sending the slides. Give me a second. So we'll be sending the slides, so don't feel pressured to like write down too much stuff. But I would encourage you to maybe grab a piece of paper and a pencil just to like take notes for yourself. We're not gonna necessarily stop to do like full on exercises during the workshop, but I'd really encourage you to just take notes of which parts of the workshop are specifically relevant to you because we'll be covering different things. Um, but it's not necessarily every single thing that I say that you'll want to do. So maybe just keep it as a little sticky note as a reminder for yourself um, for later. So one thing that I do want to talk about first is that what I find, uh, I've been giving this workshop for a while, and what I find is the like main thing when it comes to cybersecurity is actually really not like the tools that people are using. Um, it's not like, it, it's really, it comes down to like people feeling like they're owning whatever tools they're using and just getting like fear out of the way because what I find is that people are often really afraid of technology um, there are a bunch of like myths and like real things about technology that are very scary and we often feel like we're losing control and I think in that feeling of losing control and like somebody's looking at me or like even memes about like your FBI agent um, stuff like that it, it can get kind of like you don't know where to put your head and oftentimes people will kind of like fall off the boat um and just kind of like abandon everything instead of like using the few little tools that are good for you people will kind of be like oh i know i have to do this and i know i have to do that and then there's so many things that people end up doing like nothing um so what i've like moved this workshop more towards is having like tips that are actually like accessible um because what it comes down to i think it's more important to be like consistent in re and regular in the way you do these things, then like be like really good at it or have like the best tool. Um, and it's really kind of just like hygiene. You know, it's more important to shower every once in a while than to take like an amazing like trip to the spa like every year or whatever. You know, your trip to the spa every year is really not going to help you in your daily life. And it's kind of the same when it comes to your digital hygiene. Um, Another note is that depending on how on who you are, where you are, and what you're doing, you're gonna have really different concerns. Um, we're lucky in Canada, we're one of the best places in the world for internet um, like rights, even though the rights we do have here are like, you know, arguably like not the best, but they're still actually one of the best in the world. Um, so I think there are a lot of things you might see coming out of different places that uh, are very worrisome, but the you have to understand also that these things will vary in terms of geography. Um, like somebody who lives in China or in the Middle East or in Europe or in the States, 
will have very different experiences of the internet and we'll have to kind of worry about different things. And even if we're thinking within Canada, uh, depending on who you are, like if you're a black person or if you're a white person, you're gonna be experiencing surveillance differently. Um, and that this will play into uh, the way you're gonna want to interact with these things. And also like be aware, I think a lot of us are like very worried about safety and being watched by especially by the government but like when it comes down to it like the government are watching specific people and like as young uh activists we're not always their top priority so i think that also might put in perspective um some of the fears that people have so the approach i'm just going to give you a brief brief intro to uh the approach we're going to take in this workshop we're going to talk a lot about um risk assessment uh which is what kind of like the process that even like large companies will go through when they're looking at their own like uh systems and cybersecurity when it comes to like their large corporate system so it's very basic you just first identify where the possible threats are then you assess how likely and dangerous they are. Then you can develop tools to counter that. And then you just see if it works. So I'll give you a little case study. Um, so you have a grandma and grandma's been watching the news and she's really worried. She's like, I know that the internet is a dangerous place or I know that the world's a dangerous place. I, I wanna be safe. I don't know how to be safe. So she kind of like Googles it. Uh, she calls her nephew, she calls like, tech savvy team whatever and they're like oh you should get like these amazing like surveillance cameras so she like buys this like fancy like top-notch like surveillance system that does all the stuff but then she like falls down the stairs at some point and she breaks her leg and then in the end the, that that's her surveillance system was no use and there was no point to it and so i think this is the first time I give this example in such an abridged way, and it's not coming off, coming off the best, but I think this example is just like, if this grandma would have wanted a system that worked for her, she should have got, gotten like one of these little buttons that you can alert, like if you fall down, or if she did want a security system with cameras, she should have one with those subscription services or somebody like monitors to make sure, whatever. So in the end, like the grandma got, like she could have paid like thousands and thousands of dollars to get this like cut, cutting edge tech. But like as a grandma, she didn't necessarily know what system she was buying. She didn't necessarily know what were the real risks. Like a grandma doesn't need necessarily this type of like security system. She could have gotten like a much better system for much less money, but she didn't necessarily know that. And in the end, like she broke her hip. And then like the most likely thing that will happen next like it started, she had a security concern. She got the system that had nothing to do with the actual risks. Then she ended up getting hurt anyways. And like most likely I find what people do when they'll like purchase a system or invest time and energy into something and it turns out not to work. You'll either like try a different system but oftentimes people will kind of like abandon it or be like, oh, I'll do this later. Or kind of just be like, you know what? I tried this whole thing and it doesn't work. Um, so in the end, you really want to find a system that is like within your your reach in terms of time of energy you want to spend into it, but also just like the understanding that you have of it. You know, you, you're not going to want to like encrypt everything on your computer um, if that doesn't fit your needs, if that just adds like difficulty to your daily life. So we really want to be thinking about what are the realistic, helpful, and relevant solutions that we can have um, in our lives? And I think generally also in tech, it's very common that people will kind of be very protective um, of the technology they use, or there's kind of like a, a war of who's the fanciest, like, oh, I do this, but do you do that? Oh, you're doing that? It's not as good as this other thing that I'm doing. You know, there's a lot of, um, almost elitism, I think, in tech. And so I think all of that really just gets in the way of people, of like tech being accessible to people. And it's like, yeah, I'm using Google Drive to make these slides. Like, yes, I'm using Zoom. And 
I'm using them because I'm aware of the risks that I'm taking every time I use Google services or when I use Zoom. Like I know what these risks are and I know that for my purposes, these risks are really not that big and that the benefit I'm getting from using tools that are accessible to many people really outweighs the small like risk that Google might be looking at my slides or you know whatever other things that entails. So I think when we're looking at these things, you want to ask yourself, like, are these tools appropriate for your problems? Um, do you understand how they work? And can you realistically incorporate them into your everyday life? Because if you can't, if you know you only every once in a while use it, it's not going to really be useful because you want to be able to use it like consistently for it to be really yeah, for it to make sense and for it to even be useful. Because if you only use it like once a month, you know, in the end, you're you're exposing yourself to risk um, regardless. So going back, we're going to be looking at specific threats that people in the, demogra the demographic of this workshop might be exposed to. Um, and then we're going to talk about what what are like realistic, accessible tools that we can use to mitigate those risks. Um, how are you guys? Do you guys want to participate? Because we could have a little, you know, interactive little conversation. But if you're not down to put on your mic, I can also just keep it a little more abstract. If anybody wants to pitch in in the chat or turn your mics on. You don't have to. Um, so when we're talking about assessing risks, and this is where your little pen and paper might come in handy. Um, so we want to talk about first, what are the possible risks that you're exposing yourself to? Um, so when assessing risk, we're going to start by two things. We're going to start by looking at how um how large of an impact it could have on you so we're going to do high medium and low so high impact is the impact is, is substantial so it'll actually like affect your life it can be what something like i'm going to lose my job or even like if it impacts you like emotionally like oh i know it's going to really mess with me i'm not going to feel good medium is it's damageable but recover recoverable so it's more of an inconvenience um like if somebody starts like harassing me on Instagram and starts like writing shit on my like photos, like, yeah, it'll be like bad. Like I don't want people to do that, but it's definitely re recoverable and low is the impact really isn't, isn't really anything at all. Um, so like, let's say me using zoom, I'm like the potential risks that, when I use Zoom versus using another service that might be more safe or might be more like whatever. Um, even if some if something was to happen, like if somebody hacks the chat or whatever, it's still a pretty low impact. You know, you just close the Zoom and then you're like, oh, we'll talk to you guys later or whatever. Um, so it's low impact. And so the different risks will really depend on who you are, like what your job is, what communities are you in, uh, what like identities do you have? And then the second part is like, how likely is it? Um, so you can have something that's very, very high impact. Like if it were to happen, it would be really bad. Then you want to ask yourself, how likely is this thing to happen? Because if it's like low likeliness, but, um, and we measure this by saying that the threat lacks motivation or capacity to make this happen or significantly impede um, whatever it is that you're doing, then you know, like you might not be as pressed to deal with this problem. So what we want to focus on is really things that have high to medium impact and high to medium likelihood to, that have both of these things. Because otherwise, there's a million things we could talk about. Um, but at the end of the day, we want to talk about realistic things. So for let's say one thing that people are very worried about usually is government surveillance. Um, so if you're kind of just like, an undergrad student, sometimes you go to protests, you, you're doing your little thing, like the impact of the government surveilling you uh, is relatively minimal. Like even if they are reading your texts, even if they are reading your emails, 
there's not much that's going to happen at all. And the likelihood, honestly, is very low, um, especially we're going to go over Canadian law later. Um, it's, it's very low that they're looking at you. So as we go through the threats, um, the, we're going to talk about some common threats. As we go through them, keep in mind this idea of high and medium impact and most uh, importantly, high and medium likelihood. And think what is most likely to be similar to my experience or to happen within like my context. So in general, I think people, when, it, when we say surveillance um, and when we say like, we talk about like cyber violence, we talk about hacking, doxing, like all of these things. Um, we often like, at least for me, uh, imagine the threat as either like this big, like the government or like the police. It's like either this like overarch or like Amazons, like these big, huge bodies. Or we think of it as like somebody that's like hooded in the dark, they're like typing fast. Um, and so I think that's a lot. It's, and so we think about maybe cyber threat as something that's very like vague, mysterious. It, it's kind of unclear. And I think that adds to the anxiety uh, when it comes to people acting on their own cybersecurity. But like truthfully, most of the risks comes from uh, people within your social circle. So a lot of it can come from individuals that you know personally. Um, so it can be anybody like that has a personal vendetta against you. So like an ex, uh, somebody who like doesn't like your work. It can be somebody who like a colleague that's kind of like, I don't know, pissed at you. Um, it can also be something like your landlord or your employer trying to find information on you. Um, it can be fam family members like snooping around, like looking at what you're doing on the internet. Um, it can, so th that those are the category of people who are within your own social circle. So people who you most likely know. Um, and if that does ring bells for you, like maybe write this down. Another category is people who you don't know who kind of stumble upon you on the internet. So this will kind of be in different categories. It can be anything from like a cyber stalker, like somebody who thinks you're hot or somebody who wants to really interact with you. It can be people who um, don't like what you do. If let's say you're an artist or as an activist, you like are very um, outspoken on the web. Maybe there are people who disagree with what you're saying and then they start targeting you. Um, these are kind of like, I would say the two main group of people who could uh, act as risks or threats to most people. Another one is kind of more like, uh, they're not targeted towards a person. They're kind of more like, it's a more of a chance encounter that you'd be targeted to these types of things. So one is a privacy breach on your device. So if you've like downloaded a shady file and you have something in your computer or on your phone, if you lose your laptop or you lose your phone and you don't have a password, people can find your devices and then do things with them. And then you have like sort of like these large scale, large scale scams, which are kind of just like somebody calling you on the phone and being like, hey, you want to cruise or like the email equivalent of that. So those are some like basic common risks. And then we're going to go a little more detail. Um, so some so I have like a few common scenarios. Um, let's say if you're a queer person and you're not out to your family, um, then the threat could, the, the most likely threat could be your family and social circle. So your main concern would actually be your family not finding out that you're queer. Um, so these would, would turn into behaviors of stalking, compromised devices, and you want to look at your own online presence. Um, let's say, for example, you are part of a compromising community or line of work. Um, so let's say you're a sex worker, then you're going to be more worried in this case of law enforcement and corporate surveillance, specifically because you're doing this type of work. Um, as I said earlier, if you're an artist, public figure, or somebody who's vocal online, then the most likely people who could cause you harm would be kind of just like strangers who don't like what you're doing. And then if you're just like a regular civilian, you don't really like do anything, then one of the most likely threats would be more of those like random occurrences, um, like large scale scammy type things. Um, we kind of talked about stalking and harassment. And also I think 
when we're talking about cyber violence or things that can happen on the internet or like cybersecurity, um, it's not just like somebody stole my social insurance insurance number. Like cyber violence can also just be like somebody tweeting about you, somebody sharing one of your pictures. It can be like super like common stuff like people are met, like messaging you on Instagram. Like it doesn't have to be like a huge big thing for it to count as uh, cyber violence. Another thing to look out for is corporate breaches. We saw it with Ashley Madison, you might remember, or Desjardins, which is a little more recent, um, when hackers will kind of like obtain private information from companies over like a large, large quantity of clients. So you wanna be careful about that specifically if you are part of these services that's being hacked. Um, but also just in general, especially if you use the same password on different websites, they'll, you, you'll have people who will kind of go through this information and then cross reference with your other accounts. So let's say like you have a Neopets account and your Hotmail has the same password as your Neopets. And like you don't use both anymore. Now you use Gmail. But let's say your hot your hotmail still has the same as your Neopets and Neopets get hacked. Well then somebody could gain access to your hotmail account. And you might think like, oh, it's not so bad if somebody has access to my hotmail. But maybe that email is still associated with some other of your accounts. And so it can kind of like stumble from there. So you you really want to be careful to change your passwords frequently, especially when you hear of a corporate breach. Um, specifically because you don't want things to kind of like fall into a chain reaction. Um, and we're going to go back over passwords in a second. Um, device breach is kind of what I mentioned earlier. Um, so, and it can really just be like losing your phone. Um, like one of the best things you can do for yourself is have a password on your phone. Um, it sounds really silly and like maybe it adds like a fraction of a second every time you have to open it. But let's say you lose your phone and there's not a password on it. You're probably still logged into your Facebook. You're probably still logged into your emails. You're logged into a bunch of things that are and like now Facebook and Gmail are you log in through to so many other websites through these sites that this person actually has access to a lot of your information. So like even if we're. And this kind of goes back to my example of like, you can use the like biggest, most fancy security systems. If you don't have a password on your phone, you're kind of like doing all these efforts for nothing because you could just lose your phone and then lose access to all of your stuff, even though you're using encrypted emails, even though like you're doing all of the stuff. So it comes down really to just like basic little things that are part of your daily lives. Um, I'm also gonna talk briefly about, um, we're gonna talk about encryption again, but when it comes to encrypting files, I'm not gonna go through the actual protocol with you guys. You can Google it, it's super easy. You can download specific softwares um, that will do this either on your phone and on your computer. Um, one thing that I would recommend if you do have files that you wanna encrypt is to not just encrypt like one folder or one file, because it's kind of like, you know, if you have one file that's encrypted, it's going to be the first thing that people are going to look at because there's clearly something there, you know, it's kind of just like putting a big flag on it. So you want to make sure to not point towards it when what you're trying to do is um, hide it. Um, compromised accounts is kind of what I mentioned earlier. Um, if somebody has access to your email or your password for various accounts, um, one thing that I didn't really mention yet is stuff that's more like coordinated group effort type threats. So you'll see this often in sort of more like uh, alt-right type communities or even um, in more and more you see this type of thing, I would say in, also in activist circles where you have like multiple people doing a coordinated effort to kind of like bring down one person. Um, and oftentimes one of the tactics uses doxing, that's D-O-X-X-I-N-G. Doxing means when somebody will um, share your personal information online. So that could be your phone number, that could be uh, your home address, your parents' home address, your work address, like whatever. Um, and, but that will happen really specifically 
when against like public figures um, or I guess any, I guess you see it too now when it, it happens to like, there's a viral video of somebody doing something that one group disagrees with. You'll have like everybody pile up against this person. Um, so that could also be a thing, but these occurrences are more a little random. And unless you're a public figure, it's not necessarily something you should be worried about. Um, so now we kind of went through different risks. Um, I don't know how, I hope I didn't make you guys like more anxious. Um, so let's talk a little bit about minimizing these risks and being like, okay, now we kind of have an idea of different things that could happen. Um, we're going to talk a little more about government and police surveillance more specifically um, after this, but they're kind of in a different categories of risk. So as I said earlier, it'll be really about building habits. So these things are kind of like random occurrences. And regardless of if you prepare or you don't prepare for it, they'll happen regardless. Like these are things that just, yeah, they just happen, you know? It's like falling down the stairs. You might or, it might or might not happen. So what you wanna do is once it happens, there's not, much, there's not much you can do, which is why we want to be preparing in advance and want to make sure that if something does happen, we're prepared for it and we're ready to, you know, we're ready to act and damages will be controlled. So you don't want to necessarily start with like the hugest, biggest thing. So start small, look at what's realistic, look at what, uh, what is the most important thing and then kind of build from that, you know, build like one step at a time. Don't be like, okay, I'm switching messaging apps. I'm switching emails. I'm like buying a new computer. It's like safer. I'm like installing all these things. Ah. Like start one thing. And then once you've like kind of integrated that, then you can move on to the, to the next. So the five essentials, I would say, or you could even say four. Um, so the first of all is really your password. So we talk quickly about a phone passwords, but you want all of your accounts to have strong passwords. The password is like the key to your door. You can have like a fancy camera system. If there's literally not, no locks in your door, if you leave your key like in your doorknob, nothing you're going to do is going to make any difference. So it's like really corny and we've heard it so much, but you really want to have strong passwords for all of your accounts. You want to have different passwords for your all of your accounts and you want to be changing them pretty reg regularly. I would say every six months, uh, give or take. And like how often you do it is really depending on you and like your own like capacity and preferences. Um, but just keep that in mind. Then the second thing I would say is the most important is be aware of what information about you is available online. Um, we're gonna talk a little more about that, but that's gonna be like, one of the main ways that people are just gonna find out things about you and have like a capacity to do anything that could like get to you is really just Googling you. They're just gonna look up your name. And oftentimes when you look at people who can do a lot of damage, sometimes they're just really good at Google um, and good at more like social engineering type stuff. So like pretending that there's somebody else or whatever, but a lot of it is, is stuff you can have access to as well if you kind of use the same tactics that they use. Then you wanna make sure that your devices are malware free so that they're just like safe, that you have an antivirus that's scanning your phone or your computer, and you wanna back up your data re regularly to secure locations. And then just take care of yourself and your community. Am I, is, are there any questions so far in like any of the things that I've said? I've kind of went fast over a few things. Okay, so my, there are different like strategies for passwords. Um, there are a bunch of services and websites now, and I think Google does this now and a bunch of other things where they'll kind of ha like save your master password for everything. Um, there are websites like OnePass or services like OnePass, stuff like that. Um, I'm not a huge fan of it just because it's like, if somebody has access to that, they'll just have access to like everything. Um, so like if Google knows all of your passwords, well then if somebody has access to your computer, then they also have access to all your passwords. 
So that's up to you. If the benefits you're getting from like those services outweighs the risk. If it's like, oh, my computer's at home and nobody has access to it and it has a password and this and that, then like, okay, go ahead. Just be aware of the risk you're taking. And then if you take that risk willingly, then that's like perfect. Um, what I would recommend as a tip, so first of all, the longer your password is, the better. Even if it's like words, it's like not a, it's not like random letters and numbers. It's just the longer it is, the better. So one trick would just be to use a passphrase instead of the password. Um, so just something that's longer. Then once you have your passphrase, you could change certain letters for numbers. You could add symbols. You could do all sorts of things to, to get it a little more uh, randomized. And then one trick that I like is using acronyms. So let's say you think of um, a movie that you like and you have this quote from this movie, then you could use like the first letters of every word, uh, which is the tip at the bottom. You, so you use like every letter, oops. Um, so you, let's say you replace the one on the bottom here is to be or not to be. Um, it's a little too clear, but if, if you guys have, you know, things that are easy to remember like that, what you have in the end is a password that is a random combination of numbers, letters, and symbols. But to you, you don't have to remember something that's like super cryptic because you know what quote or whatever thing it refers to. Um, and even better if like, for you, you're like, okay, Facebook is uh, where my friends are. So I'm gonna remember this quote from the show Friends. And then it'll be much easier for you to remember it uh, the next time. So I think using logical associations is a really good way to have different passwords for every um, different main websites. Like let's say whatever small websites you use, like I can share passwords if they're all like pretty useless in your life, but you know, you want, you want your main players like your email, your social media, all of the, so, the different like main social medias to have different ones because you want the risk to be isolated to that service if there's a breach. Another good thing is um, use two-factor authentic authentication. So that is when like you log in and then they ask you like, oh, we texted you a number to your phone, please enter it. Some people are reluctant to um, give their phone numbers to whatever uh, website they're using, which is totally fair. But if you do use that, it's it's really adding an extra level of security. A lot of major companies require two-factor authentication for their employees because it really it it really saves you a lot of trouble if somebody is trying to access your account. So that's my bit on passwords. Like if there's one thing you can do after this workshop, it's really just go and change your passwords. Like this is the number one thing you can do for yourself. Um, the other main thing you can do for yourself is just Google yourself. So like Google yourself and go through every page, especially if you have an uncommon name. If you do have a common name, you can, or everybody, you should also look at this, Google like your phone number, Google your home address, Google the name of any like specific things to you. So if let's say you're doing like you're writing a book or you're like doing whatever, any like sequences of words that are related to you, any usernames that you've used consistently on different accounts. Um, so you just wanna really go through that um, and see what like what is available on you. You can reverse search any of your own pictures. Um, and then once you find what's available, if there's stuff that you don't want up, you can contact the individual websites or take the steps necessary on each individual website to get it down. Um, auth automatic phone check-ins are less of a thing now. They were more of a thing a couple of years ago. Another big loophole is if you have your own website, um, when you register a domain name, the service will ask you for an address. It's like, I think legally required to get a like actual address. So that's a loophole oftentimes where people will kind of accidentally reveal their own home address. So if you do have a website, you want to make sure that you go to your domain name um, provider and then just make sure that you, sometimes you'll have to pay extra for this, but you have the like privacy setting checked or the the address that you give is like a PO box or is like a generic address that doesn't go back directly to your home. 
Um, we're going to talk about personas in a second. Are there any questions so far? Okay. So talking about encryption, um, I think encryption now sounds much more, it, it used to be very, sound very fancy and be very fancy and be pretty complicated to use. Now, if you want to use encrypted communication, it's actually like, like so easy. Um, I would mainly recommend downloading Signal, which is an app that's very commonly used by a lot of people. There are a bunch of different encrypted messaging apps. Um, I'd recommend Signal, yeah, just because it's the most used. So it's the most likely one to, you know, to actually, um, to, for you, for it to actually kind of replace your text or, you know, to, to make its way into your daily life. Um, the one thing about, so you'll see things, I think Facebook, Instagram, I know WeChat offers uh, encrypted messaging. Um, I wouldn't recommend these because we don't necessarily trust these companies. We don't know necessarily what they're doing with the stuff. Um, a lot of people will use encrypted emails. So the thing about encrypted emails is that you need, you need it to be encrypted both ways for it to be truly encrypted. So it's like if person A sends an encrypted email to person B, but person B uses Gmail, well then when they send you an email back, like it's not safe this way. So the fact that it's safe this way, it, it's against the purpose. So I find, I personally prefer to go through uh, signal versus encrypted emails just because it's it's more useful and I generally don't like emails. Um, if you do want to move to services like ProtonMail, um, I would recommend doing that within like your, let's say your activist circle or within your company or within your group of friends so that all of you guys know that you're all using it together. And then it makes sense to be sending emails to each other that way. Um, we're going to be talking about VPN. So are there any questions about encrypted messaging? So also encrypted messaging means that anybody who could intercept whatever message you, you send um, and intercept in like whatever way that that means, means that whatever signal or data they would get would just be a jumble of like letters and numbers and whatever. They wouldn't be able to know what's actually being uh, said. The only person who can actually see and read what it is that you sent is the person who you intended to send it to. Um, so yeah, very, very useful. I, uh, I have friends who like only use signal, like for texting and generally there's not really a reason to use anything else. Um, it's like, you could just be like, Hey, can we migrate this conversation to signal instead of talking on messenger or whatever? Yeah. Um, so VPNs are kind of like in the same uh, train of thought, but instead of being for your digital communications, it's for it's for your web browsing. So VPNs stand for virtual private network. Um, they can be used on your phone or on your computer, and they're generally um, just like fast, secure, and they they work in a similar way. So they will encrypt sort of the the data coming out of your computer. And so anybody who would try and spy in on your computer or look in or intercept anything, they wouldn't be able to uh, look at what you're doing. The only people who could really know what it is you're doing when, when you're browsing is you and uh, the VPN service. Oftentimes people, you have to pay. A lot of them are on subscription services. There are a few that are free and that work with ad revenue, but it's like, I don't know, would I, I wouldn't necessarily trust a free VPN because it's like, what are they doing with your data? Um, it's a like very decent investment. You can also use it just for spoofing your location. So like um, pretend that you're somewhere you're not. So let's say just for Netflix, um, you can just pretend you're in the US and then get US based media. Um, so it's a, it's a very decent like investment if you do have the money for it to just get like a monthly thing. It works, you just like, let's say if you have it on your phone or even on your computer, you just turn it on, then that's it. You do the, everything else just like regularly on your computer. I think, I'm not sure the pricing you should, you would look, you have to look it up. I think it's anything from like five to 20 a month. 
but yeah, definitely a good investment. Um, TOR stands for the onion, uh, uh, the, the onion. I don't remember what the R is. Does anybody know what the R stands for? Hmm. Oh, well, um, TOR is a, sort of like a VPN on steroids. Um, it's more powerful. Oh, router. Thank you, Samuel. Um, it's uh, much more powerful. I The thing about Tor is that it's slower um, and a little more finicky to work with. Uh, that Tor is with what you can access secret websites or the dark web. Um, I would recommend using it if you're in a country that has pretty uh, in like severe internet restrictions because it will give you that extra layer of security um, and it will give you an extra layer compared to VPNs that could potentially have workarounds, especially if you're in, in yeah, countries where it's a little more dangerous uh, to be doing things on the internet. It's a little slower and not good for file sharing, which is why people don't necessarily use it uh, on the regular. So that's just a little visualization of how a VPN would work. So really anybody who would try and intercept your communication between you and what you're doing um, wouldn't be able to see it. But a VPN won't do anything about like um, what happens once you're on the internet. So what happens like once you're on Facebook or what happens once you're on Google. It's really just that, that middle section be between anybody who could intercept your communications. Um, are there any questions about anything I said? Um, so this I'm not going to go through, but you guys can go through it later. Um, so these are just going through specific lists, um, depending on what it is you're worried about. And then just general tips or prevention strategies against these specific things. And then I'm just going to talk about al uh, an alias. I'm not sure how to pronounce it in English. Um, so an alias, oh, alias, that's it. Um, an alias is, I would recommend using it if you are participating, let's say, in a community or you want to do something on the internet and want to be like completely anonymous, like you really don't want people to trace it back to you. What you'll want to do is like, you know, like, make up a, like essentially like be a catfish, I guess. Not really, no, never mind. Um, but you wanna like have like, let's say a fake name, you wanna have all the, the type of stuff, like you wanna post on forums, like ha have like whatever little thing. So what you wanna do is you wanna start working with a fresh email, so an email that you've never used, that that is not associated with any of your accounts, that doesn't use any of the names or usernames you've had. Um, and then you want to link, you want to essentially have it like fully separate from any of your own personal information. So you're not going to have any of your like pictures in common with this new account. You're not going to have any names. You're not going to have any phone numbers that are going to be in common. You want this to be fully separate. Um, and you want to have like, yeah, a consistent backstory that's credible. So you're creating like a new persona. Um, let's say if you're doing sex work on the internet, this this could be a good uh, way to go about it. Um, yeah, for act for different activist purposes, uh, that's a, like very low low cost way to do things in like a fully anonymous way, and even better if you're using a VPN while you're doing it. Um, yeah, and then so once you have all of your kind of like little you kind of took stock of like what are the potential threats you like did the things that could mitigate the risk um you want to know how to respond because no matter what you did to mitigate the risks once once it does happen once you so if somebody wants to dox you and it happens it'll happen anyways so you want to damage control um one of the main things I would say is that these things can be super overwhelming um so just like self-care you don't want to burn out ask people for help, like friends and family, to be like, hey, can you help me like uh, even just like moderate 
the comments on this thing or can you help me just like keep track of this stuff you want to especially if you could consider taking legal action you will want to document everything super thoroughly so what i would recommend is taking screenshots of everything you like you keep everything like in an excel sheet you take keep track of dates you keep track of like communications you want to have like a, as much data as you want because if you do want to go and the take the legal take legal action and like as legislation gets better about these things it'll be more and more realistic as well to to actually uh, prosecute cases like this the more data you have like the more uh, the easier it'll be to even like file a case to start with and then you know actually back back up what it is you're trying to do any questions about any of this and just generally also if you do like the way things are set up right now there are some laws in canada that will give you rights over um different like digital things that happens um but they are somewhat vague and not extremely prosecutable so you'll have that which means that it's like the, the laws are there but the way in which they specifically apply isn't clear. So I don't want necessarily to discourage people to do it, but be aware that it's like a very tedious process. So talking more in the realm of digital activism, um, I think in general, to just be aware of like what, what cyber violence is and then just recognizing it like within your circles you know um and just being aware like what is doxing what does it mean to share somebody's address online or what does it mean to share somebody's personal information online being like doxing in most cases is like it's an act of violence and it's not an acceptable way to deal with things um and to recognize it when people do it because sometimes it's like one is done against people who uh, we have, like, we disagree with or whatever. Um, it, it seems okay, or sometimes it, we will minimize it, like, as it happens. Um, even just like, oh, some, like, some racist posted some stupid shit and now people are, like, going after him, whatever. Or her, I don't know. Um, it's like there's a level at which like once we're starting like sharing phone numbers, sharing home addresses, like sharing pictures of like their family or other people in their lives, like that's kind of like going too far. And it's it's important to recognize that around you when it's like happening to people within your community and people who you care about, you want to um, like help them if you have the capacity for it. But also if it's happening, if it's perpetuated by people within our community, we also want to just at like not you don't need necessarily to go on your high horse and be like hey like don't do this like do it if you have the capacity and you want to but just to be aware of what is happening um yeah around you and then just talking generally about the idea of surveillance culture um like what does it mean for us to to be surveilled all the time and to sort of consequently act as extensions of a a sur like a surveillance culture, you know, just the idea of like reporting posts on Instagram or Facebook, like what does it mean to report that post? Like what what like dynamic are you involved in? And just being aware to not necessarily like haphazardly um, do these things or like what, what does it mean to like tag somebody in a post? Like on, fa I know especially on Facebook, a lot of people will not put, put um, pictures of themselves. They'll have like fake names, this and that. And it's like, well, if you have a friend who's specifically doing that, like what network are you, are you involving them in when you're tagging them? Um, same for like Google Photos that will use facial recognition on your pictures, all of these things. Um, so just to be aware of this idea of surveillance culture. And one concept that's really interesting that I wanna talk about uh, that was co coined by Steve Mann and he coined all sorts of other surveillance related terms, but surveillance to me is very interesting. Um, you have this beautiful graph made by Stephanie, age six. 
um, which kind of looks at, um, so the idea of surveillance is when somebody who is not in a position of power is turning surveillance back on the powers that be. Um, so let's say when you have a citizen like recording a police officer, that's an example of surveillance. So then the idea is how are we creating alternative networks to surveillance and alternate networks of surveillance. So like something that comes to mind for me is just like the idea of um, filming police officers when they're interacting with black people. So a lot of people have started doing this and we just record just to be like, if something happens, I have it on camera. So, and then once something happens, people will post it online. So this is actively being like, we have our own surveillance networks and we are agents of surveillance, but then it's like, what, how, how do I want to kind of wield this power? And then how, what kind of uh, systems are we building? And then being like, well, we're trying to, you know, point out the fact that surveillance culture is linked to this sort of carceral system. Uh, well, I mean, is fully, you know, like police surveilling citizens. And then when you do something wrong, they send, they send you to prison. So being like, as activists, um, we look around us and kind of say like, this is acceptable, this is unacceptable. And then being like, I'll post a video of this racist person when they're acting racist and people being like, this is bad. This is like our alternate ne alternate network of surveillance. And so it's important to ask ourselves, like now we have this power, how do we want to shape it? And what do we want these networks to actually look like? Um, how do we want to behave as a group? And being like, what can we even imagine? You know, and, and not just be like, oh, well, this is that and I'm not that and place ourselves as oppositions. It's like be beyond just being opposed to like, okay, the idea of like, well, we're not gonna act like cops to each other. Well, what does it mean? Like, what can we imagine? And then even being like creative and think beyond these limitations and being like in an ideal world, what would a system of accountability look like? What what would be like the perfect way to do things. And then being like, we do have the technology to do things. We are already participating in these systems. How can we rethink our position within uh, these networks? Does anybody have, because this is like more and more of a hot topic, um, you know, as people are getting canceled and that people start talking about cancel culture and then it's like all these things of, um, I think there are many arguments to be said on many directions. Um, and unfortunately, I think I see a lot of people speaking, the people who I see speaking, speaking out against cancel culture are oftentimes people who've like done something and refuse to take accountability. Um, but oftentimes, like there's so much to say about you know, uh, the behavior that we're having through our carceral systems. And it's like, we've, we've gone this far creating these alternative networks. I think now the next step is reimagining them um, with, with the feedback and the like live um, exercise that we're doing right now of being like, what does accountability look like in this day and age? Anybody got anything to say about alternative networks of surveillance, the cops, about surveillance, about Stephanie's beautiful graph? You guys are not very talkative, that's okay. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about, I'm happy I like sped through that in an hour. Um, thank you, Anton. Um, I guess I don't see how many people are in this workshop, whatever. Um, do we want a break? I just like sped through this hour. We have like, we're at slide 43. We have like 15 slides left. I'll take the first answer. Yeah, it's going to be on YouTube, I think, within uh, a period of time. And also the slides will be, uh, the slides will be sent out. Thank you for participating. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit. Oh, my slides are not finished. It says subtitle, please. It's work in progress. Everything's a work in progress. Um, so I'm going to talk really briefly about the Canadian, the Canadian legal infrastructures. Um, 
when it comes to cybersecurity and just the internet. Um, so I think just the main idea about the Canadian legal infrastructure is, is that, so point one is that worldwide, we have some of the best legislation. The second point is that our legislation isn't really worth shit. So like, um, and kind of going back, uh, I saw I, we gave this workshop with uh, Ewan Stevens last month. Um, and they like their uh, lawyer specialize in AI and they like really go in depth into the Quebec law. And so the my new understanding of Canadian law as it being not worth shit is kind of thanks to them. Um, because what what they were explaining is that all of these laws are like are very interesting. They say they have all these things to say about like our rights and this and that. Um, there is quite a large co corporate lobby uh, that kind of makes them, like, the laws specifically are kind of vague. So they're like, the laws will kind of say, like, oh, I can't hear me well. Is that a common theme? Can other people not hear me well? Yeah, it's a little bit, um, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. It's a little bit like. Oh, strange. Um, maybe my, hmm. you know what? I have an external mic. Let me just go grab it. Yeah. So I guess it's five. You guys have four minutes to go pee and grab water. I'll be back <laughs> at five over five. <laughs> Sounds good. Sure. Can you? Okay, let me just. I'm just trying to get my sound, but while I try and do this, you go ahead with the question. Is, is Hello? Yeah. Uh, so um, I know we're about to go over the legal uh, part of the thing. Um, but, um, I just learned about, I don't know, it's about the US, but how it affected us here. Uh, I don't know if you know about Section 230 and all that, like, it you know, all that uh, played against, like, the non, uh, you know, all the internet companies don't have to regulate their own con content. I don't know if it makes sense. Uh, you know, I can be protected, but you, I don't know if you know about Section 230. I'm um, just like... I'm, I'm looking into it like right now. <laughs> what? Go ahead, go ahead. No, what did you say? J'ai pas entendu. Uh, attends, est-ce que tu m'entends mieux? Okay. okay, is this fine? Is this fine?
Okay, what about this? Is this fun? Oh, but now I can't hear you guys. Oh my god. Okay, my audio situation. Also, I'm keep going. Everything I'm reading into it right now. Is there a Canadian equivalent to Section Two Hundred and Thirty or something like that? Um, I'm not sure if there is a Canadian equivalent because essentially, I'm not sure. The removal because is there like a consequence of section 230 that you're interested in particularly or an application of it uh, yeah i might be going uh franglais for a bit because i don't know oh go ahead um but basically uh i'm just interested in the way that you know uh, most of like youtube facebook uh you know, Google, they don't really regulate the content, uh, even though they have like tools and I'm air quoting right now, but I don't have my camera on. But um, I was just curious about like, I saw this super explanative video about section 230 in the States and all the failings of that. But I was curious about here in Canada, like why did we just do a copy paste of it and the big tech don't have any like, uh, like uh, one thing to do here. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm interested between the two different leg legislation. I don't know if it, it's relevant to our discussion right now, but I was mm -hmm. just like uh, curious, vraiment curieux beaucoup. So that's why. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not aware. I'll um, I'll look into it more. But since Section Two Thirty, it seems so. It seems to deal specifically with yeah, like protecting like a uh, third party serve or companies like Facebook, Google, as you said, from third party content. So like, let's say if somebody posts something on the website, um, that's like illegal or offensive, whatever, the service isn't liable for what this person posts. So I think, um, I'm not sure if there's a specific law, but I think if it was to be prosecuted in Canada, um, I'm sure there would be a similar ways to apply the law to also protect these websites from this, but I'd, I'd have to look more into it. Um, I can tell you about, so the, the pieces of, let me, so let me screen share back. What do I have going on? Okay. So, um, okay. No. Yeah. Here we go. Um, so the pieces of legislation that we have in Canada when it comes to like just internet things, um, you have the so the Canadian law, ha you have the Pri Privacy Commissioner of Canada. So they have um, two major sort of laws. You have the Privacy Act, which is actually one of like, which at the time was quite groundbreaking, groundbreaking in 1983. Um, so the this will kind of protect the public. And then you have PEPIDA, which is a 2004 legislation. Um, which deals specifically uh, with the private sector. Um, so, the, so if there's something like what you were saying, Antoine, it would be within Pepita, um, because they're the ones who will regulate um, companies, whereas the Privacy Act will regulate what the Canadian government is able to do. And in Quebec specifically, um, our, we have the uh, an act on uh, information held by the private sector. It's actually from 1994. And I think the Canadian law is actually somewhat uh, based on the Quebec law. And there's more uh, precedent. Uh, there's a lot of precedents within Quebec 
uh, between 94 and 2004 of uh, people just of uh, jurisprudence. So Pepita was kind of um, informed by that. So we'd have to go digging within these laws. I personally am not much of a law person. It's so, <laughs> I had to read so much into it for uh, the law workshop we gave last month and it's so painful to read through. And so at the end of the day, even if there's a law that will kind of like recommend or even you know say a certain thing the way that it's actually enforced um is is going to be quite different or not necessarily different but you know the law and the way that it's enforced are are two different things so i'm not sure how you know thorough canadian courts are about cybercrime but my guess is that they're just not that thorough um still you can the website of the office of Privacy Commissioner of Canada is super interesting. They are making like a great effort to make things like legible and understandable and accessible to the public. Um, if you do have privacy concerns about any of your information that's held by a company or that's held by the government, uh, they actually have a really fun, well fun, a very usable tool um, where you can go and report a concern and they'll specifically they have like this interactive thing to specifically like tell you who to contact for your specific issue. Um, and it, it's like surprisingly helpful. So if ever that's something that's of concern to you, um, go check out the website. Um, and then when it goes beyond law, so when we were talking earlier, so we're talking Privacy Act here that uh, regulates the government of Canada. But the things that are beyond law, um, one of these things is local pol police departments, because since police departments are part of um, municipal jurisdiction, actually they're not subject to Canadian law, uh, to, to those specific Canadian laws when it comes to uh, cybersecurity or privacy. Um, you also have, you know, kind of like government agencies that like, like the Canadian equivalent of the FBI that's just kind of like doing their own thing. Um, they're extremely uh, opaque when it comes to what they're actually doing, what information they're actually collecting. So, you know, there's a point at which we just don't really know what's going on. Um, one thing that we do know is one thing that the Privacy Act um, does state when it comes to what the government knows about you uh, and your information is that the government kind of works like in silos. So let's say um, immigration has some information on you because of the uh, because you're you have like a, an application that's pending or whatever. Um, they're required by law to only ask for the information that is specifically relevant to the thing that you're doing. So the like your name, your address, whatever. Um, and if like another department, let's say in like health, like the health silo of the Canadian government like has other information on you, they can't just like willy nilly send information left and right. Um, they have to like follow a, a specific procedure to exchange information between government bodies and government agencies. So although it's like, you know, if we're going back to like the shady government, whatever, it's like they could have access to whatever they want. But the fact that the, it, there is a protocol to be to be followed means that there has to be a reasonable there has to be a reason for which these government agencies would be going out of their way to requesting this information. So, you know, if you're just like a regular citizen and it's like you're you you have no specific reason why you would be specifically surveilled um you can kind of like rest easy in the fact that um there are some regulations um you know they're not just like well i don't know i don't know what they're doing another thing is that uh, anything when it comes to intercepting information so everything we said earlier about encrypted communication um for information to actually be intercepted in Canada, you need a warrant for that. So it's like if the police uh, sus suspects you to be a drug dealer, they can't just like take their little police gadgets and like look into your phone and being like, are you receiving drug texts? Um, they actually need a warrant to intercept your, specifically your electronic communication. Um, and so once again, it's like, 
you can kind of assume that the government is not listening in on your calls or your texts or your browsing uh, unless there's a valid reason to get a warrant. And to get a warrant, you actually have to like go to a judge and they have to make a case why getting a warrant specifically for you as an individual is like necessary uh, for, to like their inquiry. So there are many steps for this to happen. It's not just like, whoop, the police has like a, a ray gun that suddenly read my text. There are steps and protocols uh, that are required in Canada for these types of things to happen. Uh, one thing that is that more, more likely uh, to happen is surveillance at protests. Um, so still, it requires a warrant to intercept uh, communications, but at protests, it's the, the applications of the law will vary depending on the locality. Um, one thing that you should know is that if your phone is password protected, um, not a fingerprint, but really like password protected, you do not have to give your password under the right to remain silent. Um, I think if your phone is like fingerprint password, I the fingerprint doesn't fall within your right to remain silent. Um, so that's really important to know. So you don't have to, they, they can confiscate your phone. Um, I think they might need a warrant to confiscate your phone, but then again, you know, well, what do they care? Um, so that's another really good reason to have a password in your phone. Some people will recommend leaving your phone at home. Um, I would not recommend leaving your phone at home just because what you're gaining by having your phone with you and being able to contact people in case of emergency and stuff like that just kind of like outweighs um, the, the, oh, here you go. This is bigger, it's better. Um, yeah, it, it's just safer to have your phone with you. Something that I could recommend is having a burner phone. Like if you have an old shitty phone with a cracked screen, you could just pop your SIM card into it and bring that to the protest with you if ever you're afraid of something. Um, but yeah, I would say maybe just keep a, keep a password on. There have been, there have been accounts of people being tracked uh, being people being arrested after the fact through the like location data on their phones being like oh we saw that you were at this location at that time thus you have the press at the protest thus we are arresting you um, I don't know specifically what technology was used to do that um, so if you do bring a burner phone I have like these little flip phones that are really cute. You can buy them on the internet for not too much money. So if you do want a burner phone, get one of these older ones just because they, they can't really do shit except deep calls. Um, so you're not gonna be tracked with the shitty ass flip phone. And uh, don't consent to searches. And if, uh, if, you are being arrest if you are being stopped by police, you can ask if you're under arrest. Um, if you are not under arrest, you are free to, you ask if you're free to leave, because if you're not under arrest, you can leave. And if you are under arrest, you have the right to ask why. Um, any other questions specifically on what we just covered? Let me pull uh, I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Sunil. Um, yeah, so far, I mean, uh, thanks so far for the workshop. It's really interesting. Of course. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, uh, how would you share information with protesters when it's clear that some people are tracking you? Um, I think just using signal because even well, even if you are being tracked. Well, OK, so let me. So what I heard about the way that police will track at protests is that, oh, I need to find, let me see what it's called. So maybe I'm talking out of my ass here, but the way that they'll track it is that they'll kind of like tag send out like a tag to people in the area and so afterwards they won't necessarily look at the location information on your phone they'll just look at do you have a tracker on your phone or not and if you do have the tracker it means that you were there when they kind of like sent out 
this thing to your phone. I really have to look up the name for this technology. And so then it's like, well, if you have your smartphone on you already, then you can use Signal um, because Signal is still going to be encrypted. It's still going to work um, and you can still communicate with people uh, with it. But then it's like, well, you have your smartphone and then you have the tracker on it. Um, Cause if you just have like a burner, you can just call people. I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, it's like, I guess if you have your phone on you, you already have your phone on you. And you, if you're being tracked, you're all be, already being tracked. So it would just be getting out of the area as fast as possible um, and using signal to communicate. I'm not sure since it's like, and it's like, I think that, and we're gonna talk about this in a second, but since the also the technology that police uses changes and we don't always know what they're using, it's hard to know, like, will turning off your phone change anything? Uh, until we know specifically what they're using, I like don't know if like, yeah, turning on your phone would change something. Um, yeah, so, because I'm, I'm not sure. And I think that would also be for like, because it's like, if you're just at a regular protest, um, especially like in Montreal, protests are very tolerated. Um, you know, you're not necessarily likely to be literally like tracked and followed out of the area. Um, I think it's more if you stay in the area. If you're at a protest where you're like, you know that it's gonna be a dangerous protest, um, you know that there's gonna be like police brutality. And most of the time, like when there's gonna be like really like big like blowout protests, we kind of know in advance. So I would I would just recommend if you know that you're going to a protest and you're gonna like, shit's gonna happen, um, just bring a burner phone in advance like that you've kind of like got your bases covered or whether you bring a burner or not, just like coordinate with the other people you're with of being like, if we're be bringing a burner, like everybody's bringing a burner. And then we have like a text line of like this person texts this other person. And it's like, we have a network of like, I send my text, to, like these people and then these people, you know, and you have a network for it to like go quickly. So you're coordinated. And so like, you don't have to use a smartphone that can send a message, like whatever, whatever. Um, if you do decide to bring your smartphone, um, something that I would recommend is there's a, this concept uh, called a Faraday cage. So a Faraday cage is literally just a metal box, um, like elevators are Faraday cages. So it's just like literally a metal box. And what it does is that it prevents signals from going in or going out. Um, so like if you're in an elevator and you're on a call, most of the time the call will drop. Um, because the signals just can't travel uh, through this thing. So you can actually make Faraday cage like phone pouches. Um, you can like look this up online. You just need like a specific and it's like not complicated. You just need like a specific like metal sheets or whatever. Um, and then if you have your so let's say you do want to bring your smartphone. <laughs> you're like, oh, I, I actually really need to use it. You can actually bring it. Um, turn it off when you're not specifically using it, but I would not necessarily recommend turning it off because if you need to call somebody real quick or you need to see something real quick, then you have to turn it on and it takes a minute. Um, so I would recommend either you bring your burner and you have like a coordinated or you're like only with like one or two or three people and then it's like quick to text. So either you have your burner, it's like a flip phone and you have that, or I would say bring your smartphone, keep it on, but have like a Faraday cage type phone pouch so that what uh, nobody can just like send shit to your phone um but then you'd have to like or i'm sure you can buy it online if you look it up i'd have to look it up actually um but the, and then you test it beforehand just to make sure that okay it's actually like the calls aren't coming through like the text isn't coming through the phone's actually like um safe within my little pouch so I just like thoroughly I just prepare if you're going to protest and you know stuff's going to happen if you're just going to a regular protest um usually the police are not motivated enough to like actually track people once they've left the area but then again it's like my best guess um I don't know does this that is that a satisfying answer yeah that's great I'm gonna look at these um 
already cages. Let me see. Oh, sweet. So here, this is one on Amazon. Um, so it's literally just this like little metal casing. Um, there you go. Oh, really cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so now I wanted to touch briefly on um, trends to be looking at for, um, and I really don't want to stress you guys out with this because I don't want to give you more anxiety than we already have. Um, but these are some of the, this is like the future of what we're seeing in terms of surveillance. It's not necessarily, I think, yeah, what I mean I don't want to stress you out is that this is like as we speak right now, not a like pressing issue for Canadian citizens, like for protesters, for activists, but it might become an issue if we don't stay on top of these things, if we don't put pressure on government to put legislations for these things. Um, so these are, yeah, trends in AI and surveillance. So there's this concept called smart policing. Um, the idea of smart policing is using uh, sensors and AI technology to, yeah, make policing smarter. Um, so this might include things like phone tracking apps, um, which we kind of talked about. Uh, it can be, a lot of it is like, file management systems. So some of it is very good, some of it is very bad, most of it is in the gray zone. Things like drones, um, you have many cities that will have, do I have my lecture notes over here? Um, you have cities that have like drones that uh, go over, in the US you have that even, that will just like go over the city with cameras and just look for like abnormal behavior. Um, this One of the scariest parts of predictive, of smart policing is predictive policing. So that's a system that will kind of like crunch the numbers to identify what's a likely crime to happen and then deploy the resources before the crime happens. So that's effectively very scary. We don't have this in Montreal yet. And I haven't heard of actual cases, well, in, in Canada of actual cases of predictive policing, but there are places in the world that uh, do have this. Um, one of the, well, okay, let's keep going. So another, another trend is facial recognition, which is probably one of the biggest ones on the rise. Um, so, um, in Canada, we do not have facial recognition laws yet. Um, I know the Trudeau government is trying to act on that. Um, and there are cases of multiple things in Canada that multiple organizations in Canada that have used AI technology. One example is the small in Cal Calgary that have used facial recognition software in, when, within their uh, surveillance camera cameras, and I'm sure there are a bunch of companies too that do this. Um, when it comes to police departments in Canada, um, as we said, they're not uh, bound to federal law. So in red, we have cities that we know have used facial recognition, uh, that their police departments have used facial recognition. In yellow, we have ones that are either considering it or we're not sure. And in green, we have ones, cities that say that they do not uh, use. Um, I have Edmonton here twice. This is a mistake. Edmonton is in yellow. Um, so the way that it works is that oftentimes um, police departments don't have to like coordinate with the province or the or with Canada to be like, oh, we're going to use facial recognition. They're kind of just like, oh yeah, let's try this thing out. And sometimes it's even just like one individual uh, police person being like, let me register for this facial recognition trial. So it's like highly unregulated uh, so far. And um, one of the main uses of it um, is that they use it in cases where they, you have like a picture of the suspect and you have like this huge bank of uh, people of like whatever banks of 
people that the police has. And so usually what they'll have to do is have like literally a guy sit and like go through the pictures of every single person and compare it to like the picture that they have. So it's understandable why an AI system would make sense when it comes to comparing pictures or comparing like information with these large banks of data. Um, so there, I think there are understandable cases uh, in which AI technology can be used by police departments, but then it's just, you know, being very careful of how, how it's being used, um, by who is it being used, like how it's being regulated. And since there are no laws in Canada, it's like, well, it, I don't think it should be, like you guys have managed all this time without it. You can manage a little longer until these laws kind of come in. Um, there's a more specific example. So Clearview AI was uh, one of the main providers of AI technology to police forces. And then um, the Office, the Privacy Commissioner of Canada started an inquiry into them. And then they were like very cooperative and they were like, they decided to cease operation in Canada to terminate all contracts they had with Canadian police enforcement um, and actually retracted. They're still in the US though, and they're still doing their thing in the US, but at least, um, you know, there is action be ta being taken. And the even though the privacy commissioner doesn't necessarily have major uh, legislative power, they do have um, an impact on the way that these things are being done. There's another example of, um, I know companies like uh, IBM and, oh, I need to go look into this. I removed this slide because I thought we didn't have time to go into it. Now what I do, I'll pull it up. Um, let's see. Yeah, so because like governments are so behind on these things, a lot of this legislation actually now like belongs in the hands of like companies. So it's kind of like, I don't know, it's like both scary and in my opinion, like strangely reassuring that um, because corporations work much faster than government and corporations actually do bend and now more than ever they do bend to public pressure. So, you know, it's like if there's an, a, a good enough pressure and the good enough like market reason uh, for them to like stop doing something, they just might stop doing it. So this example is that is of, um, let, me, let me pull it back up. So Axiom is a company that provides um, facial recognition technology uh, to, um, to police enforcement. They're an American company. And actually, they create, they, they um, are a maker of body cams. And so they used to have AI technology like integrated within their body cams. Um, and at the company, they created this thing that's an independent ethics board. Um, and within that ethics board, they essentially were like, yeah, don't use AI, it's fucked up. Um, there is not enough regulation. The margin of error is too big. Um, it's just not a good thing. And then Axiom was actually like, oh, okay. Like, it's not ethical, we're not gonna do it. And they actually stopped providing AI uh, with, it, with their service. Um, and so after that, very interestingly, um, IBM, Microsoft, and Amazon followed through with this decision um, and kind of like, not sure if they did it for press or what, but they all um, decide, they all stopped providing a, their own AI technology to police services, um, sort of as in an act of solidarity. Um, IBM even sent a letter to Congress uh, in support to Black Lives Matter and uh, saying that they were not going to provide technology for, they were not going to provide the technology to kind of like oppress the people. Um, so that's quite interesting, you know, that these corporations are taking action. So 
yeah, I'm not, I don't know if it's scary or reassuring, um, but the corporations do work much faster than governments. So there is a hope in the fact that we can maybe put pressure on companies. But then you have companies like Wolfcom that after Axiom was like, hey, we're not gonna do AI for police anymore. Axiom was like, well, we're gonna do it because um, somebody's gonna do it anyways. So we're gonna do it and we're like gonna do it the quote unquote right way. So arguable, um, you know, and you'll have people doing things left and right regardless. But that's just like the portrait, a little bit of what's going on with that right now. Um, another example of this is that a lot of the technology used by these companies is actually like accessible, like much more accessible than we, than like a lot of people think. So this guy, Christopher Howell, started working on this project where he is using uh, facial recognition technology. And a lot of it is like, you know, backed with like Facebook data and stuff like that to uh, actually use against police. So like an activist type tool to uh, identify police officers that refuse to give their badge numbers. So it's like, there are ways to do tech resistance. There is a way to, you know, harness these tools and turn them around. So things are moving very fast. So, you know, Right now, uh, especially since uh, Clearview AI pulled out of Canada, I don't think there's a, a direct threat when it comes to uh, facial recognition. But you know, you, things move fast, and we don't know what's going to happen when. So it's just in general, if if you see this go around, this would be the type of thing that would uh, require like a lot of public support and campaigns and stuff like that if we start seeing that these technologies are being used again in Canada. So just keep an eye out um, is what I would say. And yeah, be aware of these trends. And now when it comes to your homework, um, yeah, so uh, I think we're gonna, I'm gonna try and finish now-ish and leave a little minute, few minutes for questions. So what I would really want you guys to do is just like when we're gonna be done, you don't have to do this right now, but I would like you to make a commitment to change your passwords. After everything we said about all these AI things, all this stuff and this and that, like I literally, you guys should just go home. You're already home. Oh my God, you're already home. You should just change your passwords. That, that's really just it. You should change your passwords. Okay, this is your homework. So you change your passwords. You Google yourself and you download Signal. Like literally these three things are a good fucking like stepping stone to start with. Um, and like, they're, they're, it's like very thorough and it sounds like it's not necessarily the most important thing because it's so easy, but literally because it's easy, like we should be doing it. Um, also downloading an antivirus on your phone or computer. I can't recommend the best anti antivirus because it might depend on what you're working with. Um, so I would just like Google like whatever model of computer or phone you're using and just Google best antivirus and then Google will tell you. Like most of the specific how to's, most of, most of the specific questions you have, like Google is a very decent place to ask those questions. Um, and yeah, just, you know, go back, to that exercise we I was saying of, you know, thinking of the different threats and the, like how likely and how dangerous they are. And then you want to think about things that are top on both. And even if, and the things that are top are not necessarily the things that will scare you the most or give you the most anxiety. Maybe you'll have something that's like low, like, low likeliness, low impact that will take up like 80% of your mental space. But even if that's the case, that's not what you wanna be looking at. You wanna be looking at the thing that's the most likely and the most impactful. And it's like, you're not, you know, it's like working out. You're not gonna overnight be like, okay, tomorrow I'm gonna start working out. I'm working out every day because this is the new me, new year, new me. It's not gonna happen. Um, so just like be gentle and just be like, okay, you know what? Leanne said I had to change my password. Uh, give yourself like a month or whatever. And you're like, you're not gonna change all of your like 2,500 passwords tomorrow. You'd be like, okay, my goal is to change like one password per week. Every week I'm changing a password for a different account or whatever, whatever it is you do, like set reminders in your calendar, I don't know. You, but you know, take it a step at a time. And actually the best thing you can do, I'm gonna post this in, eh, 
I'm going to pose this in the chat right now. Um, and it will be in the presentation when we send it. This website, Crash Override, is really fun. It's a little interactive tool that will um, guide you through doing all sorts of security things for yourself. So secure your online accounts, prevent doxing, fortify your website, blah, 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 blah. And then you click on it. And then it will ask you questions specific to your case. So you say, oh, I have a WordPress website. And then it'll tell you what to do. And it's really, really step by step. Um, so like, if there is anything you can do for yourself, let's try and complete this crash override. Try to get it as high a percentage as you can. Um, and this is like a super gentle way to go about these things. Um, I have two other little websites for you. Uh, Data Detox is a little similar, similar to Crash Override. Also, one thing about Crash Override, um, this was created by a bunch of women uh, after Gamergate. I don't know if you guys remember when a bunch of guys got angry. Out. I started something else. It became something else, but it was just in the gaming community. A lot of cyber violence was happening, and then people got together and made this website, which is really nice. Um, Data Detox has a similar type of things. Um, it'll really do a step-by-step -step of all different things you can do. Um, oh, the, it changed since I, I saw it last, but clear your location footprints, tidy up your apps. Um, also a great resource to go a little more in depth into these things. Um, and it might cover things we haven't covered together today. And then even more tips. Um, this one's, I think, a little less step-by-step. -step. Um, if, if you want more, there are more general tips. Um, there's like, so you might just want to like breath through it, uh, look if there's anything that you do that you're like, oh, I didn't know I shouldn't be doing that. Very good website. And uh, yeah, that's it. That That is it. That's what I had to tell you. Um, are there questions, comments, insecurities? Do you have a joke for me? Do you have, are you tired? What are you eating for dinner? <laughs> Don't leave me hanging, guys. Do we have any questions about anything? OK, which, who, who here is going to go on Crash Override? Um, so if you, so I'm part of a group called Tech Witches, and we're working on a new programming of workshops. Um, the one we ran, uh, so we did um, disorientation last month, or was it the month before? And there was one workshop that we were running on uh, international solidarity in cybersecurity, um, which we'll probably be giving again. And we're also like developing new programming. If, I guess we should have a mailing list. We're such like a baby organization, or not even baby. So we're just disorganized activists. Isn't that a recurrent theme? But um, maybe if you want, if you guys want to keep stay posted, maybe give me your email and we're going to start a newsletter. I, this is my promise to myself. You know what? It's my hand right now. Start a newsletter. Because uh, we just started, we were like dormant for a little bit and then we started working again this year. Do you have any, um like social media or anything for tech witches? I do, but it's kind of dormant. It's like embarrassing because like okay, we haven't used it in so long. There's a, I'll, I'll send it to you. I don't know. There's a Discord, but the Discord is dormant too. We're like in the process of reorganizing all of the things. Um, but this is the Facebook. Oh no, that's the wrong link. This is the Facebook. Um, and I guess when there will be an update, it'll be posted there. 
Um, Perfect. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Leanne? Otherwise, thank you so much for this. Um, it's been really great. Um, I'm super happy that uh, like folks came out and I hope everybody learned something. <laughs> I certainly did because uh, despite being an activist for years, I'm not tech savvy at all. So um, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's been You're very, welcome. very helpful. Um, and yeah, if you do have like social media or anything for tech witches that you want to send to us, um, you can mm. even send it to me. Um, we'll post oh, it. Perfect. Yeah, I think I'll like, uh, I'll send you this presentation and I'll get, I'll talk to the others and I'll ask them what's our, what's our social media. So we'll <laughs> organize and then we'll send it in the email. Perfect. Thank you so much, Leanne, and thanks Thank for everyone. You. Thanks to everyone who came out. Uh, the YouTube link, uh, when it's up, will be will post it um, in the event so that you can have access to it. Just to answer that question. All right. Thank you Sweet. so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.